You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Filmmaking Conversations with Damian Swaby. Listen to conversations with award-winning filmmakers, directors from the golden age of television, and creatives from the indie film community who continue to inspire the next generation of filmmakers. And now, over to your host, Damian Swaby. Tara, how are you today? <laughs> I'm good. It's a Sunday in L.A. It's hazy today, but I'm doing all right. I wish it was sunny again, but not yet. Ah, so it's unlike how it is in England right now. Luckily, it's actually sunny for us today. So um, I've been enjoying it earlier. I can happily say so. I love the sun so much. Me too. It makes everything better, doesn't it? It does. But thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Um, after watching your reel and seeing the bags of energy you put into it and the not just from your reel, but from other things I've seen from you, you've got the talent to be a dramatic actor, that's for sure. And you also add a comedic element to your skills, which is not usually done in a very good way. So I appreciate someone such as yourself coming on the podcast. I appreciate that. <laughs> No, it's from the heart, believe me. Thank you. So you yourself obviously have done a lot of work and you've been involved in the industry for a while. Tell us how you got started and why exactly did you want to become an actress? Well, I got started by going to the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in Hollywood. Um, and my initial, I majored in musical theater. My initial okay. in getting here to Los Angeles was going to be singing and acting but then once I went to AMDA for short, uh, that's when I fell in love with acting, specifically comedic acting. And then um, I just, once I graduated, I just focused on that here in Los Angeles and doing a lot of improv for many, many years. And that always helps in the uh, commercial realm of things and booking commercials. Um, and then once I started to book films, uh, I think it was after maybe a couple of films is when I realized I wanted to um, become more involved with that process and become more of also a filmmaker as well as an actress. Improv. A lot of people love improv. I used to love improv when I was an actor. What are the main things in improv that you love and are there any struggles that you have whilst doing improv? Um. I think it's great just for everyday life with rapport of just a, a yes and and getting feedback from people and knowing not to like shut down an idea. <laughs> I also use a lot of stuff that I learned from an improv class that you you would not be allowed to like cross your arms and listen. And I cross my arms and like listen. And I realize that's yeah. a closed off body language thing. So even in life now, if I catch myself doing that, I'll uncross my arms just because I did so many years of improv class and they'd be like, uncross your arms. <laughs> so that's, oh. that's useful in, um, in real life, but for overall improv, I think it's, yeah, it can be a uh, nerve wracking getting up there to be like, I hope I come up with something good. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it really depends on your team and who, who you're with. Cause if you can feed off people and you have a really good rapport with them, I don't think that any show can actually end up bad i think improv is just fun you take what you get and roll with it fun musical theater can be fun why did you decide to get involved with that and how did that work for you i just love singing i i was in voice lessons i think since i was like eight and i just adored it i was obsessed with christina aguilera and celine dion they were uh, it's just all of them Two great of, voices yeah like they're they're awesome and um uh, yeah, I guess once my school started to do musicals, which came late when I was in high school, they didn't start doing them until I was a junior, but I was in both of them, junior and senior year. Um, and that is when I realized I fell in love with it. I really like the, the acting aspect of it, not just the singing, um, and playing around with it, getting to speak. And then you go into a song, uh, was a lot of fun for me because I could bring more character to it versus I almost went to Berkeley College of Music, which would have just solely been singing, voice, vocals. Um, and I'm glad about the choice that I made because it, it, yeah. it opened up for more possibilities, right? 
completely. Yeah, more possibilities. And you're a good at- actor, so it, it makes sense that you do the two. So tell us about a, a musical theatre experience that you loved and one that you hated. Because, again, I'm bringing myself into it again. Not that I normally do that. I'm no narcissist, believe me. But I've been a part of musicals as well. But I really, really preferred straight acting. Um, so, yeah. So what parts of musical theatre did you really enjoy? And is there a show in particular you can tell us about? Gosh, you know, I didn't, once I graduated uh, from AMDA, I already knew that I didn't necessarily want to go into musical theater. So I didn't pursue it once I graduated. I pursued more improv, commercial acting, and then just acting in general. Um, But uh, I was in in school, we have to do musicals in school. Uh, and yeah. I did, I did Chicago, which was a lot of fun, but Chicago is a lot of acting and, uh, singing at the same time is kind of talk singing, uh, which I really, in, in some parts of it, um, Sorry, explain to some of us that might not understand what exactly is talk singing. Well, you know, like the one song lip shits, uh, <laughs> Those are the two, those are the two words I can remember right now. There's okay. like a, 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 where there's seven women lined up and they're all talking about how they've killed their husbands or the bad men in their lives. And uh, it's them talking, telling a story while also saying, he had it coming, he had it coming, da, da, da. It's only that for a very short amount of time. And then you skip into, now let me tell you this story about this guy and this is yeah. how I killed him. Uh, which I really enjoyed. And once I got it, that part of the acting that you get to do, I was like, oh, I like this better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's understandable. Yeah. And the acting that you enjoy and the acting that you do, tell us about that smooth transition you experienced becoming a straight actor. Oh, God, I don't know if it was like smooth at all, but um, I... Once I was in improv and taking a lot of improv classes, I think that helped me utilize my comedic senses in the commercial room. And once I started to book commercials, then I had a little bit more faith in myself as an actor and I submitted to larger roles just for short films and other films and stuff like that. Um, But I think the transition was, I mean, it wasn't easy. It was a little tough because you really do still have to make your own way, find footage. What student film can I be yeah. to get stuff for my reel? Luckily, um, I'm making a lot of my own stuff now. But in the beginning, um, I think what helped me the most really was just being in improv class and and uh, learning to utilize my comedic skills so that I could book more. And once I booked more commercials, I felt more confident overall as an actor to, to move on and um, try and book bigger things. Excellent. And did that involve getting an agent? Cause sometimes that can be hard and some agents, I wouldn't necessarily say uh, put people in a box, but if you come from musical theater, they might not see you as a serious straight actress. Did you have any of those problems and what was it like when you finally got representation? Yeah, I I mean, I still put as a skill, they were like, oh, well, you can sing. But luckily, they all would always make me read, especially a commercial copy prior to signing. So that's how I got in. It's basically like they, the two meetings I had when I was younger was like, here, go out, you get five minutes, read the script, come back and read it to me when you're ready. Yeah. Uh, and that's how I gained representation because it kind of put you on the spot. Versus now, once you've built up your reel, I have enough footage that they can go, yeah, she can act. Where can we put her in the agency if we don't have already someone who looks like her and already covers the roles that we would be submitting for? Um, But yeah, I didn't have too much of an issue of like, oh, they're only submitting me for musical theater versus uh, they didn't believe I could do commercial because... Uh, I was put on the spot in the meetings I had of like, we need to prove that you can do this thing. And, and then, yeah, I did, I guess. <laughs> and you're currently living in LA. Yep. Los Angeles. Is that where you were born? Uh, no, I was born in uh, Boulder, Colorado, actually, but I was moved to Las Vegas at like seven days old. So I was oh, basically okay. kind of born and raised in Las Vegas Um, until I moved to Los Angeles. Um, and I've been in LA for like 19 years. Oh, so you're basically, yes, I'm basically a Los uh, an Angelino. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. 
what was it like growing up in Las Vegas and what is the the film and theater and musical theater and acting scene like there? Oh God. I mean, because I was in high school and my high school didn't have musical theater until I was a junior. Um, I, I, you can see a ton of shows, great concerts, a lot of talented people um, travel to Vegas to do a show. So I went to a lot of concerts and saw a lot of shows but in regards to working or being more exposed to people my age who were interested in in um, acting and musical theater, um, the, I didn't wasn't very exposed to that in Vegas. There wasn't a large community. It felt like, but once okay. you come to LA, everyone here is kind of there's a little aspect where they're all in the business in one way or another, and I think that's where I learned the most about. Uh, just what I'm doing now is once I came to Los Angeles. Everyone I've spoke to that's an actress or an actor has said they want to move to Los Angeles at some point in their career, Mm -hmm. maybe not for their entire life, but for a period of time. It seems like the competition in Los Angeles is fierce and the standards are very, very high. How do you cope in these situations? And what do you do when, unfortunately for all of us at times when you're not working? I scream, cry into my (laughs) flow. Um, (laughs) uh, Yeah. And I, I make my own stuff. I, I beg, steal and borrow from friends and whoever is available to continue to make things. I think the biggest thing that saved me in being in Los Angeles is that I started my YouTube channel, maybe it's seven or eight years ago now. Uh, I was way more active on it before I've gotten busier with filmmaking and that takes up more time. But my YouTube channel, I was like, I don't, I hated waiting around for casting Mm -hmm. just to get a call. Can I get an audition? It's really, it's just annoying and can really tear you down. Um, So me having something else to do, putting myself out there on YouTube, um, talking about movies and TV or just even doing a cover song and making videos Um, and I edit all of those too. So it took up my time and brain space so that I wasn't so concerned about, um, when's going to be my break, which you don't really get big breaks anymore. You just have to charge through, keep working. And if you can make your own stuff, but filmmaking is really hard to just say, I'll do that. YouTube Mm. is here to just sit in front of my camera and, and maybe do a live stream or, or sit and talk about something. But filmmaking is it's a whole other puppy and it costs money and, and more time. But I believe the payoff for me soul wise is a, is a 10 out of 10. I love that. The payoff soul wise is a 10 out of 10. I think I can understand what you mean, but please do explain just in case I'm incredibly wrong in my own mind. Yeah. So I, uh, in Los Angeles, I think it's really hard. You get, you get, bogged down with all of these thoughts of like, I haven't booked. Why am I not working? Am I going to get another audition? How am I going to get an agent? I didn't get a call back. I did get a call back. I didn't book it. Like that's the life here. It's a lot of rejection. And I feel like you have to find things that feed your soul. That is a little bit outside of the business somewhat. And for me, if I can control it and make my own stuff, meaning I'm the executive producer, I maybe am also the the director or I'm the lead actor, I'm helping make this thing the way I would like it to be made. Um, That gives the control back to me and also just helps my soul in general to go, all of this stuff will still always exist, but I am happier for doing something for me that I didn't have to wait on anyone else for that I can also put out to the world and say, Hey, I made that. That's cool. That, that helps me and makes me feel good and fulfilled. I love it. So you take the bull by the horns, which I love and respect. And that's one of the reasons why I invited you on the podcast. (laughs) One of the problems a lot of us have when we do take the bull by the horns, as you rightly said, filmmaking is so expensive and there's a lot of layers to it and complications. It's a miracle we make anything and anything gets done. In terms of funding your own projects, a lot of people use crowdfunding. A lot of people have other ways to fund their films. Without being too nosy, I say that now after I've, I'm about, as I'm about to ask the question, yeah, how yeah, do you yeah. fund your films and projects? Because you've got friends that will help, it sounds like, but yeah. how do you get the additional cash for 
certain things that we all need as filmmakers. Totally. Um, so there have been really great people on my YouTube channel, like when I made my first film, A Real Killjoy, that I did reach out to. And they did just, I was like, here's my Venmo. Can you help? Um, and there was just people who would send a dollar, five bucks my way that were subscribed to my YouTube channel just to see me continue do the doing the thing. Um, and other things is like, yeah, I work, I work a lot of jobs right now. It's, it's very slow, but, um, like to make your you, which is my most recent film. I made that with my friend Skylar and those, when you have someone that you can split costs with, but also I'm, I'm asking DPs I've worked with before, as well as sound, um, my PAs on set, if we need people is limited to two people. They're my friends. They're not a huge daily rate. The DP, yeah. which his daily rate would be huge, knows me, has worked with me before. So his rate is smaller. People are still getting paid, just not as much. Yeah. And then if we can steal a location, that's great. A real killjoy, I didn't have to pay for an empty part of the desert in Burbank. I just had to get in and out quickly before someone was like, I don't think you're supposed to be here. Yeah. Um, and then, but for like your you, we did have to uh, rent out a, a location, but luckily my friend Skylar and I were in on it together um, and we limited it to a, a one day shoot. So every- oh, gosh. How long yeah. was the day for one day? Um, for that, it wasn't long because we knew what we needed to get and we tried to limit our scripts um, to one location. So we knew, oh, we need a bathroom shot, we need the booth shot, and we need outdoors. Can this one location provide us with everything that we need for the film? Yes. Um, and I think it it was maybe an eight, eight hour day. Um, we moved quickly. I think uh, I was kind of mostly directing that, but Skylar was, uh, if I would be on screen, he was kind of directing. And we, we knew that we had to move and there wasn't, we wouldn't go, hey, can we get another one just because of blah, blah, blah? Because yeah. the, the tough part about directing yourself is you're not in Video Village. I don't know yeah. what I'm looking like when I'm saying this line. And I also don't have time to do playback. So um, I think that uh, in order to get that eight hour day for one script, we're always thinking short film. Can we utilize one location, which uh, that's what keeps our costs low. And um, how quickly can we shoot this if we hire the right people meaning if it's already lit for both sides and maybe it's on a dolly or it's handheld it may go by faster and we don't have to um do a ton of of coverage that would eat up a lot of time so this film sounds very very interesting burbank in the desert tell us oh. what it's about oh well that one that one's a separate one your you was shot like in in um inside at a location but the one in Burbank that was in a, a desert uh that was a real killjoy and that is my little zombie flick it's it's three minutes and it's a lot of fun it's the very first thing that I I wrote and directed and um yeah I, I just needed me a, a friend uh to play my friend and then I needed a zombie to be walking towards me and it needed to be in the yeah. desert and we were we were able to get it done in in a very limited amount of time. I think that day was only like six hours, which was great. Because wow, we had, we had six to move. hours. Yeah, I, I because I don't do a lot of takes of me. If I felt like, all right, we'll get to maybe two masters, two mediums. Let's get and move fast. If my coverage is out of the way, then we can move on to like zombie coverage and other people's coverage. And yeah, just get it done uh, quickly. I'm I'm. Uh, when I work with friends, I can sometimes be a pain because also in my brain is, is producer as well as like mm. AD, meaning yeah. we need to move. When do we need to be in and out of the shot? And my shot list had times on it. Great. So, and that, great. yeah, thing that really helped us, meaning from 10 to 10 35, we need to be shooting this master. And at what time is it? All right, we got five minutes. Can I do one more take? If we can't, we need to move on. And that's that's what has helped me um, keep the days short, but also uh, still get the shot. Luckily, you and I, well, we're similar age and we're able to embrace um, this digital technology that we're in so we can create yeah. our own stuff. We can 
use locations that we might not have permission to use. We can help have friends help us and, and progress in that way. If we were back in, let's say, the days just before MIDI DV came about and we had yeah. to use film and we had to have this elaborate post-production process using film baths and, and things of that nature, it would be very expensive and it would change things for you, I, and a lot of other people who make their own content. Sadly, yeah. that means we might not be able to do it. If you weren't able to do what you've done, creating your own content, how do you think that would have made you feel in this day and age? And what do you think you'd be doing instead? Scream crying into my pillow. <laughs> um, a really, truly, a YouTube lifted me up in a way mm. that made me a better actor because I was then being validated for just like me as a person. Like, she's cool. She's funny. And for it's so hard in LA if you get rejected a lot or you don't get enough auditions. Yeah. So uh, to be honest, I think it would be really tough. I would still be in a headspace of like, why am I not booking? When are auditions coming? Me waiting around, which is really torturous until yeah. someone was like, just util utilize your, your personality and, and put it on YouTube and just see how it goes. Um, and I think if I, if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have learned more about me. I mean, I think I learned a lot about me when I did YouTube too, of just like, if you put yourself out there, there's plenty of people who are just going to love you for exactly who you are. And that gave me more confidence in just walking into an audition room of like commercials are very much like they're just hiring you for you. Film yeah. is a little different. Um, yeah. And that, that really helped in that regard. So I don't, I don't know how it would, how it would go if I, if I hadn't of, dived into YouTube or this creative space that we're, e we're able to access easily now um, probably would have been still a little, maybe a little dark and a little sad because I don't know what I would have been able to pull from except still just waiting around for someone to call, which always sucks. And it, it, it totally does suck and it can leave people very, feeling very isolated. And in my opinion, from what, I've, I've learned from doing this podcast. So do you have a support structure? Or do you have advice for people that are isolated and don't have people around them that may be able to help them if they haven't jumped on the new digital age of the way we're doing things? Right. I mean, I would say, do you mean like help them in, in film regard? You mean just it personally? You mean just in general? Personally. Yeah, yeah. I feel like the thing that, really did help me a lot because I do live alone in a studio. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Was, was getting out and, and meeting friends, whether it's for a coffee or dinner or anything just to pull me out of my temporary structure of what my life looks like, whether it's auditions, uh, uh, not getting auditions, being at the house jobs that you're juggling. Um, if I was able to get out of the house and be maybe in nature or just in the sun with a friend and you talk about anything else, yeah. um, that has been the thing that has helped me a lot, which is why, but this is also another, you were, you were saying to get away from the, um, the digital stuff, how could it help them? And I guess for me, it was, it was really just like human to human contact, speaking about things that had nothing to do with the business or what I was doing or how hard it was yeah. and more to do with just like, let's go out and grab a drink. That helped me a lot. Um, which did in turn another like soul feeding thing for me is something that I did start earlier this year in January, which is, is, is digital content. But I started to go out to restaurants and film them and then edit it together mm -hmm. for an LA eats and drinks, separate Instagram of just my content. And it's solely focused on food and drink, which okay. has brought me like a ton of joy. Like I love food and I love drinks and that has nothing to do with my face, how I'm acting, me getting booked. It's just me going like, I'm going to do this thing and I can do it as long as there's food and drinks around. <laughs> so that's, that's helped me. Um, but I think away from the digital stuff, if there's any way to get out and have human to human contact, we are lacking. 
in that regard. As of now, there's a lot of people are just always online, which it's great that we're meeting here online. I wouldn't be able to meet you in person. Right. But, um, I do think people should force themselves to get out and meet people in person. There's, there's a sort of kinship and connection that happens when you're face to face and not behind a computer screen that I think helps us internally. I completely agree with that. Uh, I had a discussion with a friend about it who spends a lot of time behind a computer screen. And I think sometimes you have to push yourself or really remember that this internet, this way we've been speaking and everything is quite new to human um, behavior and everything. And I still believe we need the contact. We need to sit face to face and interacting. And like you said, doing other things uh, with the food and everything. That sounds great. I've, I've been to many restaurants and I'm a sucker for taking photos of the food I ate and uh, I, I love a craft deal and stuff. So it is a good thing to get away from what we are and what we do sometimes and embrace other things that can help us. And I'm happy as well that you've got your own space, your own studio flat that you can enjoy and live in. Cause I don't know how it is in LA, but in London, a lot of creatives are not having their own space. It's there's a lot of people living in um, cramped conditions just because of the nature of um, having a job as a creative and that job being able to afford your own studio or one bedroom apartment. Yeah, it's tough. And and honestly, when I got this studio a while back, uh, I am a hustler. Like I said, when you're like, how do you find the money? I'm like, I do a lot of jobs. And the way that I did get this apartment was that the landlords who own it, I was like, oh yeah, I can walk your dogs. Cause I actually uh. was the dog trainer for like 12 years. Um, and they were having some issues with the dog. And I was like, yeah, I can help with that. And also walk the dog for a discount on rent. And I still do that today. Excellent. So this is, this is like when you dive deep into like a creative's lifestyle, I'm not just yeah. sitting around being like, I get to do films and do, I'm like, nope, I'm, I'm online, you know, looking for remote jobs, walking dogs, babysitting friends, kids, um, anything that I can really do to bring in, uh, an income, not only to pay my bills, but also of course for more, uh, of filming and stuff like that. I love that. I love that. I've never heard of it in terms of walking a dog that to kind of help with the rent and stuff. That's brilliant. I love that. Yep. <laughs> the projects you've made and the way you've gone about making your own material uh, f- for various reasons, how much has that impacted your showreel? Not just in terms of how much of the work you've made has been included in your showreel, but how did it impact the way you go about editing and putting your showreel together, which is excellent, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I I think um I think once it was cleared for me to use prime of your life footage, meaning there there's films that are in film festivals. So I would have to wait to put them in my reel until it was all done. But um, I think uh, once it was cleared, it was like, Oh, the, these things that I've made and there's none of me in, in a real killjoy on my, on my reel, even though it it looks great. um, I, I, I think about this a lot. I go, yeah, I, I wrote Sam Jones as a woman who is protecting all the dummies around her from all of these zombies. She's the strongest one around who can deal with them. And she's a woman of very few words, which is not very helpful on a reel because in a real killjoy, I'm just on a walkie going, nope, uh, I don't think so. Like, all right, I got to go and take care of this zombie. Right. <laughs> so. Um, once, once there's, there's other things obviously that I've made. Um, and yeah, I want it, my reel is always growing. So it's, it's really just fitting in the best parts of what I have made to see if I can, if it will bump up my reel so much that maybe casting will take notice. Um, and sometimes that's not always with every short film I've made, or I just go like, yeah, I don't know if this would really help because it's it's always ideal not to have a reel that's too long. So mm. there is a lot in my reel that is from other people's stuff, feature films. I haven't made a feature film because budget, that's yeah. hard. Uh, so yeah. other features that I've been in are mostly in those reels, supplemented with some of what I I have made. So you've also written 
as we've mentioned, because you, you do your own stuff. So Prime of Your Life won Best Writing. How much yep. does writing mean to you as a creative? And where does it fit in with you being an actress who also can do musical theatre? Because you have to wear different hats. And when you produce your own stuff, you really do have that producer hat on in a big way, as you earlier mentioned. And you have to. So you've, you've in so many different situations, so many different mindsets. How do you cope and how do you have the discipline to do it and to do it so well? Well, uh, I mean, <clears throat> writing uh, in Prime Your Life, I wrote that with um, my friend and, and the director, Craig Tovey. So that helped having someone with me. I am not um, really great at staring at a blank page unless I just have a a bulb idea where I'm like, this is great. And it's going to be short. I'll be able to write it out. But, um, in general, I now have learned about myself. If I want to get writing done, I need to be part of a team okay. so that I can have someone to bounce ideas off of. And it helps me get the writing done. But in general, for a Killjoy three, this is just a short little blurb of like a Killjoy three. There was, I made a Killjoy two, the third one, um, we made a video go go campaign um, later last year for it. Everybody looked at the video, went, "This looks great." If you're going to raise thirty thousand dollars for a short film, just raise a lot more and make it a feature. Don't waste the thirty thousand on a short. And we went, "Okay." And my friend Mary, who is in a real Killjoy one, she plays Melissa. Um, she is more of a writer than I am, and she wanted to write it. So right now. Um, starting, I think now, cause she was finishing up a different script. She is going to be writing a Killjoy three, the feature. Um, and of course me and, and Matt would be the director. I would not direct it. Um, I would just be in it and executive producer, uh, basically going, yes, I like this language or no, I don't. So she's going to do an outline. We'll give her notes and then Excellent. we'll carry through with the feature because for me, I just, I was like, I don't, I, I, writing is great. I'm better at short. If, if yeah. it's a short idea, I can do that. A feature film, I'm not like, I love it. I can't wait to write act one, two, and three. That's, <laughs> that's not me. I'm like, I, I can't wait to act it out. But writing yeah. is, yeah, it's a different muscle. Short films are more fun for me. Um, and it's easier for me to access my brain for, for that. But features is like, well, that's a lot. Are there any theories or disciplines that you adhere to as a, a writer when you do have to write? Because I made the big mistake when I first um, put a short film together. It's like, okay, I've, you know, I've been acting for a while. I've seen scripts since I was a kid, blah, blah, blah. I should be able to do this. And then I put it out on the page and then I filmed it um, after a few drafts. And I was like, wow, this is absolute shit. So uh, then I started to read some books about it and all the rest of it. And I didn't quite get there still. And I was thinking to myself, what is it? What is the problem? What else do I need to read? What else do I need to learn? Who do I need to talk to? So what is your go-to way as a writer, even though you feel that your skills are best lent elsewhere? Yeah, you're saying, what's my what's my go-to skill as a writer? Like, yeah, like... Yeah. Okay, yeah. I I think that when I... When me and... Let's just, for example, when I was writing with Skylar... It's a lot of like, um, we're, we'll talk about these characters, but I think for me, um, it's a lot of pulling just from me. And if I read a line and then we say it out loud, I'm like, would she say that? She's kind of this, this woman who's desperate for love, but she's also kind of a psychopath. <laughs> um, uh, what, it, how is she going to try to manipulate him? Or is she going to be really sad here? And I think for writing for me is like saying the line, saying lines out loud and, and oh. I believe, do I believe it when I, when I say that, how can I hear it? And, uh, with this line read, if she just said, I don't, whatever she would say, like, fuck you, would it work here? I mean, sorry to curse, but you get what I'm that's saying. Right. I did. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think maybe that's the skill I utilize is, is having someone there to bounce ideas off of and hearing it out loud really helped me which is why for prime of your life, when we were writing that, it was a lot of talking back and forth of like uh, reading it on the page. I don't, I don't know if I like that line for him. It seems weird, but then if we would read it back and forth with the flow of hearing it with a, a voice, if that worked, then I went like, 
okay, I think, I think I like that and it, and it could work, but I think everything that's always saved a film is always pacing. A real yeah. killjoy was going to be absolute shit because I was stuck in the, in the edit of not of going this pacing of he needs to be slow. The joke in the film is that the zombie is zombies are slow, very slow. That's the joke when we cut to him. And I was having the most difficult time finding the correct oh. pace, having it work. And so I went to my friend and I was like, I have to be removed from this. Cause I'm watching me. I'm watching the zombie. Where do we cut back and forth from? Um, do I slow it down? yada 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 and luckily my friend who i made um prime your life with was able to help me with the edit and that saved it so it's like i don't know pacing might be the the biggest thing after after the fact that could save um save a short i guess and directing and you directed a real cool joy Mm -hmm. yeah directing can be very stressful and in some ways as well it can be isolating depending on how the process is going and how the, the, the film has been set up. What do you enjoy about directing? Um, I really like knowing that when I get to set that I'll be able to um, handle the, the actors or just be like, I think this shot looks cooler be able to have the creative uh, decisions and go like, Oh, this is how I want it to look. It's, it's cool when you can um, have a really great DP though, that I rely on to go, how can we make this look cool? Cause I don't take credit for all of the shots. It's mostly as a director, I mainly just really would like to work with other actors. I think that the yeah. best directors who give the best direction have been actors before. Um, so I think I, I would like to think that I can, speak to actors a little bit easier when I'm a director I'm like none of this stuff matters just do this and this don't worry about anything that like else just like we just want it I just my main thing is I just want it to feel real I just want people to believe the words that are coming out of anyone's mouth in any film I make so um yeah I think having the creative uh decisions being made by me but also just working with actors is a is a lot of fun for me in um having a hand in the way the story is being told through them. Have you had that experience when the actors are not able to make it feel real seem real and that may be a casting issue that you perhaps we all make mistakes we all misjudge things at times that you've experienced. What do you do when an actor's not making it real? When you, you, you're going through the motions and you think to yourself, or maybe you haven't thought to yourself, maybe it's me speaking out loud. I just don't know what to do here anymore. Right, right. Luckily, I, I only ran into that with two friends who are not actors. They wanted to okay. play the couple in A Real Killjoy too, And okay. I went, all right, uh, it's, two, it's a lesbian couple and they are two of my best friends and they are together. So I was like, well, they'll at least be believable in, in being able to hold hands or like yeah. being together, yeah. right? Um, but in the word wise, it didn't, it, it came off some somewhat natural, but it did take, that was just something that I went, you know what? I'm just going to have to let them say it, how, how they feel the most comfortable and also try to coach them to go like, um, uh here's another way we could do it to see if i could get more of a performance of what i wanted out of them but um i think the thing that has helped me the most if i'm not believing someone is is really just choosing a word or two of just like forget about what's going on and just be more playful or the, forget about the words make it make it your own i don't care about the words uh just as long as the point gets across how can we tell that story now especially if i've gotten maybe the lines that are in the script and we maybe have it and i'm not able to get exactly what i'm wanting but if they're able to say it in their own words and it comes across more real um that's great i guess my one other idea the other day i had i was like I should really just start telling actors, this is just a rehearsal. Don't worry about it, but roll uh, on it. Uh, except that they would probably know if we have to slate and, and, and stuff like that. But I could also just whatever, fake it. I feel like people, when they know it's a rehearsal, 
they're just there. And then for some reason, when it's action and it's late and they're like, they change. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And lastly, I'm going to do a little new thing that I do on the podcast when I ask two questions. It's not quick fire with five or six questions, just two questions. Okay. Firstly, any regrets? <sighs> no, I I think someone no. before and I'm like, do I? And I'm like, no, there's, there's definitely a reason I'm, I'm here doing what I'm doing today, even though it's really, it's like tough times right now. In another month, I'll have a, a better month. Um, I think every day that goes by, whether it's hard or I'm on set and very happy, um, every, every non day that I'm not on set just helps me progress more as, as a human and go, yeah, it reminds me, you really do want this thing that you're in LA for, because when I'm not there, I don't like it, um, which makes me fight for it more. So no regrets. I think it's, yeah, I just take it as it goes. And whatever I've done has gotten me here and here is pretty good. In five years time, where will you be? Oh, man. I always like to say that I would love to be the, the female Paul Giamatti. He is, actors know him, LA people, maybe New York people, but there's a lot of people who'd go, Paul Giamatti, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and he's just a really great actor. A, also can play a lead, but also a, mostly a character actor. I know who you mean now. He yeah. works, yeah, he works in, in, and has worked in a lot of- Great indie, career. Yes, great career, worked in a lot of indie films. And I would just, I would love to just be constantly working on indie films would be a blast for me. Also, sure, commercially, but I, I've never, I've never had dreams where I'm like, I want to be famous. No, I just want to be consistently working. And if that means with cool people who have a vision and they're like, we're going to make this film, I'm like, yes, great. Because I also am not just an actor. I, I um, have all these other skills from also filmmaking that I can hopefully help in their process as well in being there. So I hope in five years, I'm just on a bunch of film sets <laughs> <laughs> that are Good. in that maybe not, maybe not huge. Um, and if they are huge, great, but um, I won't be sad if they're not, I'll just be sad if I'm not working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I understand completely. Yeah. Completely. Well, Tara, thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it. a lot of words of wisdom from you and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Have you thought of upgrading your cinematography game? Would you like to have an ASC cinematographer mentor you for free? Join veteran cinematographer Suki Medenzovic, ASC, Disney, Pixar, FX Networks, Netflix, American Horror Story, as he teaches you how to create beautiful images using three lighting techniques he has mastered on film sets over his 30 plus years in the film industry. Each technique uses basic, low-cost lighting equipment so that anyone can achieve beautiful visuals no matter your project's budget. If you want to take your cinematography to the next level, visit FilmmakingConversations.com to sign up for instant access.